Good evening, Montana viewers. Uh, we're live, it says on the screen. Uh, so I hope you're hearing me. Um, my name is Brad Tyre. I'm the editor here at Montana Free Press, and I am here with the majority of our reporting staff. Uh, we're here for a program that we've called Off to the Races, who's running for office in Montana. And as you probably know, if you're here, um, the uh, news peg here is yesterday's primary election. I um, hope some of you were tracking our coverage last night as we had uh, the results on the homepage as they came in. Uh, and we're here today to talk a little bit uh, with a little bit of leisure behind us uh, about those results and what we think they might mean coming up. Um, what you were part of here is a, um, uh, a, a periodic series of events that we do via Crowdcast here at Montana Free Press. Uh, often these are member-only events. Uh, in this particular case, this is not a member-only event. This is uh, this is members and non-members, anybody who chose to sign up. Uh, that tracks with Montana Free Press's sort of republication MO, which is our, uh, our news is free to read, and it is uh, freely republishable. Some of you may see it in your newspapers around the state. Um, so we don't charge for our work. Um, at the same time, we are a reader-supported nonprofit, and the work we do is not free. So uh, we appreciate those of you who are supporting donor members, uh, and we equally appreciate those of you who are um, observers and watchers and sharers and readers of our news. Uh, that's our mission, is, is to get the news out there. And so when you, um, when you partake in it, uh, you are helping us do our job, um, whether there's money involved or not. Um, so we thank you for being here, and uh, it's a little bit of an experiment here on a Wednesday evening rather than maybe a, a lunchtime thing, which we sometimes often do. Um, so it looks like that may have worked. We've got 160 plus people registered here. Probably not all of those will be here, uh, but that's a big one for us. And we're really glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. Um, I will introduce in just a second our reporters and uh, a little bit of an outline of the evening. Um, but first of all, I would like to mention that we will be taking reader questions um, through the course of the program, maybe towards the end of the program. Uh, we've got a few that got lined up with the registration. Um, and you have an opportunity. I see you all over there in chat. Uh, I can only see you in chat. Uh, if you look over to the right-hand side of the chat window, you'll see a couple of little icons. One of them is a little, a little dialog box with a question mark in it. If you hit that, you will have an opportunity to go to a Q and A and type in a question that will get that will get ported to us, and we will see if we can make time for it. Uh, we'll do our best to make time for it. Um, one last note before we start: uh, I always like to apologize. Uh, these are sort of awkward. We're all looking at each other on a screen, uh, and we can't see you. So there are a lot of you out there watching us uh, and and watching me as I turn my head a million different directions, trying to keep up with a screen here and a piece of paper there. So. Uh, I apologize for the awkwardness in advance. Uh, introduce our staff here. Aaron Kimball Sennett uh, is at the upper left square in my screen. I don't know about y'all's. He's our lead political reporter. Um, and he's going to be talking about, well, we'll get to what he's going to be talking about, Senate, House races, uh, some of that sort of thing. Upper right is Mara Silvers, Health and Human Services reporter here, also covering the governor's race. Uh, and we'll be pitching in on some others. Lower left from my seat is Amanda Eggert, who covers uh, energy and environmental issues. Uh, she's going to be uh, helping us understand what's going on with the PSC and the state auditor's race. Lower middle, just below me, uh, my old friend Alex Sackerson, uh, who is going to be talking about the Secretary of State's race. And what else do we have you on? OPI, of course, OPI, Office of Public Instruction, State Superintendent. Uh, and then to my lower right, uh, Eric Dietrich, deputy editor, uh, who has a hand in just about everything, but is our legislative race specialist, uh, uh, especially um, going to be talking about what we can see from here about the likely composition of the 2025 legislature. Okay, there's a start. Um, I'm going to jump right in and we're going to talk with, uh, boy, I hope I didn't forget something that needed to be said. I'll loop back to it if I did. Uh, jump right in and talk to... Aaron and ask him to tell us what we know about the Senate race. Let's start with Senate. Uh, we had a Republican and a Democratic primary. I don't think we had any big surprises about the results, uh, but what did we see along the way? 
yeah, I think as you pointed out, we saw basically what we had expected to see uh, the Republican side. Um, I think there was maybe a, a slightly more spirited primary than on the Democratic side, uh, but still the, the kind of presumed front runner, Tim Sheehy, who's a, a businessman in Gallatin County uh, and the sort of anointed Republican candidate. Uh, won the primary pretty easily against former uh, public service commissioner and secretary of state Brad Johnson on the Democratic side, you know, longtime incumbent uh, John Tester won his primary uh, against a, a guy named Michael Hummert uh, by an overwhelming margin as well. So so no, nothing really out of the ordinary there. Both of those races got called by AP very early last night, if I remember. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this is the race that everybody has been uh, queuing up. Everybody has certainly already been flooded with advertising from both the Sheehy and the tester camps. Uh, what should we look, uh, should be reminder, we're really concentrating on the primaries, but we can't help but look forward a little bit to the general election because of course that's what's queued up. Uh, what are we, what can we expect between now and November 5 uh, as that race develops? Um, you know, I think just more of the same, but amplified by a factor of like a thousand. Um, you know, for the most part, these guys have been ignoring their primaries already and and focusing largely on each other. You know, there, there was a possibility that she he would, would have a serious primary in the form of Matt Rosendale. Uh, you know, for those of you who, who were following at the time, you, you saw why that was why that was scuttled. Um, so, you know, these campaigns have been focused on November for a long time now. Um, and, you know, with the, the it's sort of increasing tendency of incumbent Democratic senators to switch their party registration, such as when they're uh, on criminal trial like Bob Mendez, uh, it, it makes the, the margins in the Senate even tighter than they were before. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of money uh, from from national groups, especially uh, hammering, hammering on national issues. And, uh, you know, as much as the candidates will try to make it about the importance of uh, issues here in Montana, the reason people spend money in these races at the national level is uh, numbers on a board in the U.S. Senate. And right now that, that Senate's super close. Right. Uh, great. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to sidetrack just a little bit because we want to mention the uh, as we move to the U.S. House, uh, which uh, we're going to come back to you to talk about the Eastern District, which was really kind of one of the more fun races of the of the primary. Uh, but just to get it out of the way, I'll mention uh, our, our coverage of the Western District uh, was relatively limited. There just wasn't going a lot a lot going on in that race uh, at the primary level. Uh, Justin Franz, a freelancer of ours up in the up in the Flathead area, covered that for us. He was not able to join us tonight. Uh, as you've seen, incumbent um, Congressman Ryan Zinke uh, won pretty handily over uh, a challenge uh, uh, from uh, Mary Todd, a pastor up in uh, the Flathead Valley. So that was um, you know that was expected. There weren't a lot of fireworks there. Uh, the Democratic uh, candidate uh, Monica Trinnell did not have a primary on the on the. Democratic side. <clears throat> so we've queued up a rematch in 2024 of that 2022 race. It'll be it'll be Zinke versus Trinnell again. That was a relatively tight race. It wasn't a it wasn't a hair splitter, but it was a relatively tight race in 2022. So we're going to we're going to we're going to see that happen again. Uh, so kind of dispense with that. Not a lot happened there. And then I'm going to bring back Aaron. Let's talk about that Eastern District House race where we had. A, I'm going to get it wrong. Did eight candidates. Nine? Yeah, just somewhere between eight and nine, depending on the week. Um, okay. There was a few <laughs> okay. people who, who declared and then dropped out. You know, there was some waffling right. here and there. Uh, yeah, basically uh, eight eight candidates um, vying for uh, what was until recently, you know, the presumptive longtime seat of Montana Congressman Matt Rosendale. Um, this is a, a pretty conservative district in eastern Montana that would, you know, provide a serious advantage to an incumbency like him, but he decided to um, run for Senate and then that kind of didn't work out and then he was gonna run for re-election and then that didn't work out. Uh, and now he's stepping away from politics and that left this vacuum um, in a pretty conservative area for any number of the Republican politicians who have sort of, um, many of whom kind of have come of, come of age politically in this recent era of Republican dominance in the state uh, and, and are seeing an opportunity uh, either to test the waters for a statewide election uh, or, you know, legitimately interested in serving in federal office. I and mean, some people were pretty open about having both motivations. Uh, but in that race, the, the eventual winner was kind of somebody who on paper you might have guessed to be the winner, like with all of the, the primary theatrics that led up to this and all of the uh, um, sort of purity testing about who's more Trumpy. Uh, Troy Downing, who's the current commissioner of securities and insurance, which is the same thing as the state auditor, uh, he won 
the race with uh, not a majority margin, which could be pretty difficult in a, in a race with that many candidates, <laughs> but a sizable plurality uh, over the next uh, second place candidate who was former Congressman Denny Reberg. Um, Elsie Aronson, who is uh, our current superintendent of public instruction, somebody who spent a lot of money on this race to fund her campaign, didn't even place in the top three. Uh, so I think it was maybe surprising down the line a little bit, but for the most part, the top outcome was expected. I've decided that I was surprised that Elsie didn't place better just because, uh, you know, Alex has been providing kind of blanket coverage of the education scene in the state for the past couple of years. And so I see Elsie Arnson's name in our publication every day, yeah, <laughs> virtually. That, so that, that, that might be related. It was maybe outstripped uh, what, it, what it was actually in the race. Uh, you know, and it's worth mentioning that, uh, I mean, Troy Downing ran a relatively quiet campaign. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I didn't see, uh, I, I didn't see, uh, a whole lot of advertising. Um, but curiously enough, uh, that position, the state auditor, has historically been a launching pad to higher office in Montana that uh, Matt Rosendale held that seat uh, before he before he ran for um, and, 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 and won for Congress. Of course, Matt Rosendale ran a couple of campaigns before he ended up. Uh, I sort of feel like the most interesting story of the year has, and the one that leaves the most unanswered questions is maybe the Matt Rosendale she he race that didn't happen. Uh, and then, yeah. and then why Rosendale didn't uh, run to hold his seat in the House. Uh, yeah. We may learn more about that as time goes on. But um, and, that and, and I think it, I think it's fair to say too that you know whether or not Rosendale is there, the Republican Party, as some other people will talk about uh, later on the on the call tonight, clearly has some internal divides that it's in the process of working through. Um, you know, I think Rosendale represented maybe a more vocal squeaky wheel than some other people in the party, at least at least. Uh, given the amount of actual, you know, kind of power and influence he had as a, as a federal elected official, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, his, his retirement, uh, I, don't, I don't think, will do much to kind of quiet some of that discontent within the party. Yeah. Uh, one more thing before we let you go on that race, I feel like that race is where we saw, you know, along with the Senate race, and we're going to see a lot more of it in the Senate race, but the the House race, I feel like, is where we're seeing a, a nationalization of the of the issues uh, that the candidates are running on and talk about. Immigration is the one that jumps foremost to my mind. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the issues developed and maybe how um, the winner of the primary, what what the winner of the primary says about the issues that are resonating with voters uh, in that race? Sure. You know, a, a Republican source who's reasonably knowledgeable told me for a story on this race that, you know, obviously these people have access to polling about what kind of issues resonate uh, in Montana and nationally. And because of the saturation of natural national media and national politics in state politics those uh, those issues look pretty similar you know and i think especially on the republican side they would maybe posit that immigration poses a literal existential threat in montana but you know generally speaking these are are echoes of national conversations um you know you had people i, I will say talking about the farm bill talking about um you know more Mon things that are germane to montana but the message from almost all of the candidates was Joe Biden equals inflation and that's bad and Joe Biden equals immigration and that's bad and Joe Biden thinks man equals woman and that's bad and like there, there was not frankly a lot of daylight on those issues certain people had more rhetorical aggression I would say Downing as you pointed out was like pretty low-key um, and you know I think it, it even said at various points that uh, the approach that Rosendale took which was often to kind of like take your ball and go home is not really the approach that he shares um, but, you know, I, I think it reflects the, the sort of capture of Trumpism in the Republican Party in terms of the, the kind of talking points, even among candidates who not that long ago were not openly supportive or were openly uh, critical of the president, um, as Downing had been in the past. Uh, all right. I'm going to I'm hope I'm doing this right. I'm trying to mute myself periodically and then come back in. I've got we've got an overactive uh, furnace here in the building and I've got my window open and a lot of street noise. So I apologize. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about the race for governor. Uh, Mara, you did. Um, we had a story out not too long before uh, primary day, uh, and and Mara is is leading up our gubernatorial coverage with uh, with an assist from Eric. Uh, what what happened, and what does it mean? Yeah, so not a very unexpected outcome in this. We have uh, the incumbent governor, Greg Gianforte, on the Republican side and the most prominent Democratic challenger, Ryan Bussey, who were both successful in their respective primaries. Um, each of them had challengers who 
carved away between 25 and 30 percent of the vote for each of those parties. And we also have a libertarian candidate, Kaiser Lieb, who is not being challenged on the libertarian ticket. So he will also advance the to the general. And I think that even though it was, you know, not an unexpected outcome, I think this race is going to shape up to be pretty interesting. And I know the Senate race is taking up a lot of oxygen, but one of the interesting, well, there are two interesting things about this governor's race. And I think it's basically comes down to both the substance of what the candidates are talking about, but also just their style and their personality. I talked to somebody yesterday who said, like, I can't imagine two more different politicians, <laughs> like who, who just have completely different styles and affects on the campaign trail. And I, I think, you know, if people remember back to 2020 when Governor Gianforte was running then, um, he I would say generally ran a pretty positive campaign in that he talked about like what he was going to do and what he would represent as a candidate as like this traditional classic conservative candidate. And he didn't spend much time talking about his opponent at all, who at the time was Lieutenant Governor Mike Cooney on the Democratic side. So he kind of just ignored Cooney entirely and talked about himself in this like aspirational, look what I represent kind of way. And I think that that's probably what he's going to try to do again now. I mean, he has the power of the incumbency. He has the power of several years of track record and being able to show what he's um, what he's passed, what he's gone through the legislature, what he's done for Montana. But Democrat Ryan Bussey is a very different Democrat than Mike Cooney. And in, in the way that he runs, I think Bussey is um, is loud. He's um, aggressive. He's kind of theatrical. Um, and I, I think that he's making it his goal to to make it impossible for Gianforte to ignore him. So he is running quite quite a negative campaign at this time. He's not speaking a lot about what he will do or his policy ideas. He's trying to create a negative association between Governor Gianforte and all these issues, these very local issues that matter a lot to Montanans. And right now, in case anybody missed it, that's property taxes, it's affordability, um, child care, health care, uh, Medicaid disenrollment, um, abortion, reproductive rights. These are uh, uh, public lands, wildlife. Like these are a lot of issues that he says are classic Montanan um, values, things that Montana voters really care about. And um, he's he's trying his darndest to um, tell the voters that Jean Forte is not their guy on any of these things and that they should listen to him instead. So seeing that play out, seeing Bussy fight for name recognition in um, in a in a tough a tough election cycle when so much oxygen is being given to the higher you know up the ballot races is going to be interesting. Um, Bussy just got on TV with his first ad um, his first ad buy. Uh, but Gene Forte has spent almost four times the amount that Busty has on TV and digital ads at this point. And so it's it's going to be a tough, uh, a tough road to haul for the challenger. I told you I might sidetrack uh, and listening to you, I wanted to ask another question. I think it's sometimes uh, easy to forget after the red wave of 2020 that uh, Montana has a long and so far barely interrupted history of 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 uh, electing Democratic governors. Uh, how does how does Busey stand up as a candidate? What are, what kind of similarities or differences do you see between Busey as a candidate and say Steve Bullock or uh, or uh, Schweitzer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of people have made comparisons between Busey and Schweitzer, and I think that's mostly because of this like kind of macho, aggressive style of campaigning. We recall the branding iron. I would not be surprised if like you know Busey's a bow hunter and a former. A former gun salesman if he just shoots through bills he doesn't like i mean it's like like that kind of a thing which feels like a shtick but it's also a representation of um of these guys's personalities bullock you know never was never quite that much of a crusader um but interestingly um bussy's running mate is uh, his lieutenant governor pick is rafe graybill who was uh, bullock's top lawyer for for a while and previously tried to run as attorney general, which Bullock previously occupied. So in some ways, there are echoes to both of the um, the Democrats of your <laughs> um, of recent year in uh, in this race. And I think that there's room for uniqueness. I mean, certainly this campaign is is trying to be very different right now. Um, but in terms of like populism, in terms of um, you know, kind of shirking partisan labels and saying really like what unites us is these common values. I would say there are some similarities there. Mm -hmm. uh, just one other thing I want to say on the governor's race or or, or raise there, you know, the, it, it's been a question. One of, one of the real interesting dynamics that we've been tracking over the past couple of years is, 
you know, as the Republican Party has become so uh, kind of unilaterally dominant in this state is the divisions within that Republican Party. And in that primary um, with, uh, sorry, Tanner Smith. Yeah, yeah Tanner Smith, right? freshman lawmaker uh, from Lakeside. With Tanner Smith and Gianforte, uh, you know, one of the interesting questions going into that primary is how big is that um, anti-Gianforte, or, or not quite all on board with Gianforte voice in the state party. Uh, and, yeah. and Smith polled it at what again? Uh, Smith pulled 25, no, 24.9% of the vote um, last I checked. And that's, you know, it's it's not nothing. Um, the Bussy campaign has certainly made a big deal that even though Gianforte won by, you know, upwards of 75% um, uh, last night, they've made a big deal of saying that Gianforte basically was a loser because he lost 25% of the Republican vote. So they're trying to amplify that, certainly. Um, right. I think that Gianforte's hold over the Republican Party um, seems very good coming out of last night. But um, yeah, Smith spent a, f a fair amount of his own money. He traveled around to the state. And I think that he did um, really appeal to a wing of the Republican Party that feels snubbed by Gianforte, not taken seriously, not represented. Um, a lot of those tensions uh, definitely came to the surface last session and were even um, more pronounced after Gianforte decided to weigh in on legislative races and, and um, pick, you know, pick certain lawmakers that he said he'd work better with uh, or wor would work well with next session. And we'll get in, into that in a little bit. But I would say, I, you know, if, if Smith had cracked like 30 percent or was between 30 and 40 percent, of, of the vote total last night, I would have uh, been pretty surprised. Um, but the 25% that we saw is not nothing. And it's um, also not seismic. It's somewhere in the middle. Right. So if that race was a proxy for uh, for divisions within the Republican Party, the, the, the answer is, uh, yeah, there's a meaningful voice to the right of, of Gianforte, but not a not a not not yet a competitive voice to the right. Okay. Um, super. Thank you. I'm really uh, looking forward to our, our future coverage of that race. We're going to switch gears uh, and ask Alex to briefly tell us what happened with Secretary of State, which was next to nothing. And then we can move on to uh, the Superintendent of Public Instruction, which does have some interesting nuance to the primary. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say next to nothing. I mean, uh, both the the Republican incumbent, Chris, uh, Christy Jacobson, and the Democratic challenger, um, uh, Jesse Mullen out of Deer Lodge, ran unopposed in their primaries for Secretary of State. So, like, last night, really, we, we, that race shaped up months ago. Um, but on the OPI side, uh, the race for, for LC, to replace Elsie Arnson, uh, who is now termed out after eight years as uh, it'll be eight years at the end of this year as state superintendent. Um, the Democratic candidate, uh, no primary there. Um, two terms, state Senator uh, Shannon O'Brien was running, but the three, we, we had a very interesting two way in um, on the Republican side between uh, two former deputies of Elsie's from her from various points in her eight year tenure, um, both of whom are, have been around uh, the state public education system for a long time, Cheryl Allen um, and Susie Hedlund, who's also the vice chair of the Board of Public Education. And so um, it was a kind of a weirdly quiet campaign uh, for the most part, uh, with the exception of one um, incident about a month ago that made a lot of news. Um, but I mean, Susie had Susie Hedlund got a lot of key endorsements. The governor, um, the attorney general, uh, Senator Steve Daines, Congressman Ryan Zinke uh, also spent a fair amount of money on this race um, on travel campaign events. Cheryl, not so much. Um, I think she campaigned locally, but uh, kind of spent a few thousand dollars on yard signs. So pretty quiet, all things considered, and pretty similar messages coming out of the candidates, too, as far as, you know, really a big focus on supporting public schools, but also respecting the rights of families, um, which has been kind of a big talking point um, in, in education among Republicans for, for several years now. So, yeah. 
And so, of course, Susie Hedlund winning um, last night by with a, with about sixty two percent of the vote. Um, sorry, kind of buried the lead there. <laughs> So what are you looking for? So this is a this is one of those races where there's uh, you know we're we're seeing the end of an era after after eight years of Elsie Arnson, who has really made that position her own, um, and I guess in that way it's uh, possibly similar to what we're seeing in the uh, Eastern House District. But as you as you gear up to cover um, leading up to the general election, what do you see with that wide open? I, I, I'm not making a statement about the likely competitiveness of that race because I don't know, and that's not our job. But what are you looking to see develop between now and the general as you as you cover that race? What are you keeping an eye open for? Uh, really keeping an eye open for how much um, funding for the public school system comes up uh, among both the candidates. Uh, they responded to um, our questionnaire on that point, acknowledging that. Uh, there's going to be a really big next year um, review of how Montana at the state level funds its public school system. Um, and this, this process happens every 10 years, but um, you know, all, all the candidates in this race so far have acknowledged, yeah, there's, there's going to be a lot of work to do next year. So I'm really going to be kind of paying attention to how much, you know, funding for the public school system comes up and, um, and how much of a pinch point between uh, Shannon O'Brien and Susie Hedlund, a lot of the, you know, family rights, student rights, student privacy issues come. Um, both of these candidates, I mean, all three of the candidates, um, Cheryl Allen as well, are longtime players in the education sphere. They've been, all three of them have helped to shape state policy, state regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, Shannon O'Brien is you know, over the course of two sessions now sat on the Senate Education Committee, has carried um, some successful legislation, one of which last year was signed by the governor and increased uh, loan forgiveness or loan assistance eligibility for new teachers. Susie Hedlund on the Board of Public Education has had a, a real direct hand in conversations involving teacher licensing and school quality and um, yeah, just a whole host of things. So how much of their expertise really starts to shape and hone the talking points in the months ahead is really what I'm going to be looking for and, and kind of paying attention to. Fantastic. Well, I know you're going to miss your weekly calls with Elsie. Um, I know you enjoy those. So <laughs> congratulations. Not, not quite weekly. I wouldn't say that, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go out of order here just a little bit because I'm feeling terrible that we've asked Amanda to sit here uh, and listen to all this insight without uh, having a chance to contribute yet. And then we're gonna loop back to RN at the end before we kind of change course. Um, because I think uh, we're gonna talk about AG and Supreme Court there. And there are actually some, there are some ties between those two races to talk about. Uh, so in the meantime, Amanda, let's start with Auditor and then we'll move on and uh, hear what there is to know about uh, the PSC races. The, we had the two PSC seats open as well. Uh, Let's start with auditor, and maybe we could even just do a little primer on what does the auditor do exactly? Yeah, the auditor is basically the top insurance watchdog for the state. So they have a hand in insurance rates. They have a hand in disputes with insurance companies when um, a customer is frustrated with the service they're getting from their insurance company. They also um, deal with frauds, cryptocurrency, that kind of thing. Um, uh, tell like the telemarketing calls that target senior citizens. That's something that that office takes care of. Um, yeah, so that's that's the office. It's, it, it's about seventy two employees that work for their CSI. So a relatively low profile office, aside from being a launching pad for higher office, but actually does meaningful work that impacts the lives of of Montanans. So worth keeping an eye on. What happened last night? Uh, as regards auditor. Right. Uh, James Brown or Jim Brown, our current PSC president, public uh, service commission president, uh, won 70% of the vote. His challenger for that seat was uh, John Willoughby. He's a former policeman turned bail bondsman turned insurance salesman from the Helena area who really campaigned as the, the consumer's voice in that race. And his argument to, to voters was that he is seeing on a daily basis 
um, what happens when politicians have that office and what that can mean for rates, for non-renewal notices, for cancellations, and that he really is motivated to make insurance more affordable for Montanans. Um, he, of course, uh, did not reach enough voters with that message to win the seat. Um, and I think one conclusion that we can maybe draw from that, especially for kind of a little known office like Auditor, is that name recognition really seems to go pretty far with voters. And, and Jim Brown having, you know, four years as PSC president and also a, a previous run for Supreme Court has a lot of name recognition at this point. Right. So uh, we don't like to speculate here, but let's do it anyway. What are the odds? Uh, what year What year does uh, James Brown declare for Eastern District? Well, or if is whoever... Trent's hold, he'll serve <laughs> a term and then he'll switch to house. I mean, that's what Downing did. That's what Rosendale did. That's kind of, there's, there's a pattern there, but who knows? He says that he's committed to serving out his term and uh, fulfilling the duties of the office faithfully. Um, that's what he's, he said. Well, there, there may not be an opportunity because I think most political scientists will tell us as well that whoever wins that Eastern district house race, it's probably theirs to keep for as long as they choose to uh, keep it shy of, shy of unforeseen scandal or, uh, or uh, a decision to retire. Yeah, I was um, gonna say, I, I think I've heard that somewhere before. <laughs> I, well, I've, I, <laughs> I've heard it mostly from you, I believe, Aaron. Um So, okay, that's Auditor. What is the situation on the five-member PSC, which has, has had two seats up for election, um, two seats up for election this year? Yeah, it's, it's technically three seats, actually. Um, oh, and I'll, oh, I'll kind of go through, bad. I'll go through those. Um, one thing that I think is interesting to flag for, for folks is that the PSC district map that we have now is probably the last time we will have this map because um, that's been challenged as being um, uh, unconstitutionally drawn. And so it's uh, subject to a lawsuit that's in process. So what we have now probably we will not have again in the future. Um, and it's also kind of a, a crazy chopped up map. <laughs> like, for instance, um, the most competitive race was the District 3 seat, um, and that includes um, all of southwestern Montana and then kind of arcs north all the way up into Helena. It's a, a kind of a, a wild boundary. But um, anyway, so PSC 3, um, that technically still has not been called by the Associated Press. Um, Jeff Wellborn, a sitting state senator who is termed out of the legislature, is leading by about 400 votes. Um, and, and again, I think that there's something to be said for name recognition there. Uh, the, the number two vote getter there was a woman named Suzanne Nordwick, who is from the Butte area. She's from Walkerville. She is an engineer and she actually raised quite a bit of money for her campaign. Uh, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and despite not having held a prominent political office before, um, that op I think that helped her to get within spitting distance of that seat. Um, and then there was also a third person who ran in the Republican primary for that seat, and that would be um, Rob Elwood. He's from Hallerton. He's on the city commission. Uh, he's run for the seat before as an independent, and he garnered about 20% of the votes for that seat. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about uh, District 2, which includes kind of a south central Montana, I'll say. Um, and that's notable because we have two former commissioners who are running for that. Uh, Senator Brad Molnar, who's been in the legislature for a long time. His first stint in the legislature was, I think, in the 90s. Um, and he served two terms on the PSC previously. And then Kirk Bushman, who has served one term on the PSC um, in the late 20 teens um, before um, losing two consecutive uh, elections to Tony O'Donnell. Who currently holds the seat. Uh, that was also a very close race. Um, that came down to about 1,300 votes. It wasn't called until this morning. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, uh, something that was interesting about that race to me is that uh, Bushman appears to have done better under this map in um, the western parts of the district, like parts of Gallatin County, which are areas that Molnar has never represented as a, as a commissioner or as a lawmaker. And so again, I think there's something interesting maybe to be said about name recognition there. Yes, back on. Um, 
We have one other PSC commissioner, and I actually don't know where his situation stands, uh, that had a role in this primary as Tanner Smith's running mate. Um, Randy Pinocchi in District 5. So where, 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 what is the cycle for District 5? Uh, does Mr. Pinocchi go back to his seat on the PSC? I believe he's actually one and he is in the middle of his second term. So he's got, um, having lost with Tanner, he still has, I think, two, two years to go on the commission. Um, and I, I should not neglect to also say that, uh, Jennifer Fielder is the incumbent for, she's the only incumbent in this, um, in this PSC primary, um, in this PSC race generally. And uh, she was originally unopposed, but there's a woman named Elena Evans um, who lives in the Missoula area. I think she's in Jocko Valley, who is um, evidently garnered enough signatures to appear on the ballot as an independent. Um, those signatures have not yet been verified yet by the Secretary of State, but it appears that she's cleared the threshold by quite a bit if her count is correct um, by several thousand votes. And um, this is something I have not yet been able to verify, but her campaign reports that she'll be the first independent to appear in a general election for the commission. So that's notable. Hmm. Uh, sorry about my Randy Pinocchi mistake. I knew he was on one of the end cap seats. It was one or five and I, I, I guessed wrong. Uh, thanks for, thanks for the correction. Um, I'm going to jump real quick to uh, the simplest question that we have. Uh, Jay in Livingston asks, will there be a discussion regarding the Supreme court? The answer Jay is yes, there will. Thank you for asking. Uh, Aaron, do you want to talk about the Attorney General's race or the Supreme Court's ra court race first? Um, I guess we could start the Supreme Court race, um, okay. since that is the sort of font from which every political discourse in the state seems to emanate these days. Um, the uh, so Supreme the Supreme Court's interesting. It's a, it's a nonpartisan body, as as you might be aware. Um, and because of that, it has a different form of primary than the other primaries in the state. Uh, it's a top two nonpartisan primary. Um, so the uh, can two candidates with the most votes in each of the two primary elections for the two open seats uh, on the Supreme Court this cycle advance to the next round. In, in this case, uh, in the race for the chief justiceship, uh, Corey Swanson, who's currently the Broadwater County attorney, um, he... Uh, uh, took on the most votes in the race for the chief justiceship, and, and he was followed by Jerry Lynch, who was a former federal magistrate court judge. So those two will be uh, now, to the extent that they weren't already, um, kind of focusing their fire on each other. Um, that there was uh, a couple uh, in that district. There was a candidate named Doug Marshall, who's an attorney in, in Carbon County, uh, who didn't really make a serious dent. Uh, and then in the other, in the other, uh, the race for the other district, or the other seat sorry, on the Supreme Court, this is an associate associate justiceship. Uh, Catherine Bittigray, who represents a, a judicial district, judicial district, hard to say, out in, Mo out in eastern Montana around Sydney, uh, she uh, handily took on first in that primary, uh, followed by Dan Wilson, who's currently a district court judge up in Flathead County. Uh, the third place guy there was kind of interesting, is a former Republican lawmaker from Columbia Falls, Jerry O'Neill, um, who... Uh, is not maintains that he is legally practicing law in Montana, but um, is not barred in. So the question as to whether or not he would have actually been able to serve as a justice is well likely settled. He probably wouldn't have been able to. But um, yeah, he did not win that primary. Uh, so yeah, that that was all pretty much as expected. I need to turn the mic back on so that I can say okay, uh, mm -hmm. and then let's. Uh... Again, no particular surprises in the attorney general's race, but did we learn anything that we didn't know? Uh, or do we have a forecast about what we're looking for uh, as we go to the general? Uh, Austin Knudsen will have a, a Democratic challenger in the general um, and who did not have uh, Ben Alke, right? Who did not have a primary. Um, right. Yeah. What did what did we learn in the attorney general's race? Sure. Yeah. So we uh, n n correct. There were there were no surprises there really. Um, uh, ben Alki was the Democratic candidate. He did not have a primary challenger. He is has been the presumptive nominee for a long time. Uh, and then uh, uh, incumbent Attorney General Austin Knutson, who's a Republican, did have a primary. Uh, who is a, an attorney in Daniel's County, or actually is the Daniel's County attorney on a sort of part time basis, named Logan Olson. 
a recent U of M uh, law school grad. Uh, and Knutson went, was recorded at a, at a fundraising event basically saying that he had uh, recruited this young man to run against him in the primary because uh, you can raise more money effectively if you have a primary challenger uh, than you can if you don't. Uh, that relationship between the two of them is now the subject of an active uh, pair of complaints and, and pair of investigations before the commissioner of political practices. Uh, at this point, it's it's you know something of a moot point in terms of uh, Olson's longevity in the election. Uh, Knutson won pretty handily, although it, actually Olson captured slightly more of the vote than I would have expected, given that he was allegedly at least running a, a non-existent campaign. Um, I think he got, I have to check, but I think it's like 10 or 15 percent or something. Um, which uh not, yeah. not the number i was expecting to see from no. i've you know, heard him called a ghost candidate i'm like that's a no, pretty yeah that was pretty that solid was, showing for a ghost candidate uh, yeah you know and I, and I, I wouldn't get into what that means but it's interesting yeah that's comparable to what the the, the democratic challengers to bullock got right the last yeah. time uh, yeah so i mean I, also, I think also accused of being ghost candidates one thing just one thing yeah. to say about this is is that the practice of like quietly having a do nothing candidate in your race in order to raise more money is, is not new. You know, the Republicans responded by immediately pointing out all the instances in which Democrats have allegedly done the same thing. The uh, level of transparency that Knudsen kind of discussed this with and his pretty open like disregard for the law that um, is relevant here uh, is, I would say, unique <laughs> and, and very Knudsen-esque. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, and fittingly, I think the uh, I think the uh, uh, general election between Alki and Knudsen is going to focus on all the things that makes Austin Knudsen Austin Knudsen. And like, that means that if you're like a pretty ideological conservative, um, you know, or you think that the Supreme Court is stacking the deck against you, he's probably your guy. Um, if you're just a generic Republican who's not really paying attention, he's probably your guy. Um, and, uh, and Ben Alki will try to tell people that uh, before Knudsen, the Attorney General was uh, generally speaking a less a validly partisan position that uh, there's a lot of work that gets done outside of challenging Biden administration regulations uh, and so on and so forth. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you're someone who wants um, Republican laws to pass and be defended, and if you're like pro-life or whatever, then yeah, you'll, you'll probably support Austin Knudsen regardless of, of um, what kind of ethics or campaign finance things he has in front of him. Yeah, he's he's going to be the center of gravity in that race. No, no question. We are down the ballot to the point of uh, these are the statewide races. Uh, we don't talk about national races unless they're Montana federal offices. So we're going to leave that alone. Um, we had a whole bunch of legislative seats um, have primaries and we're going to turn it over to Eric Dietrich to hear about what you were watching as the primaries developed last night. Yeah, so the legislative races are, are down the ballot um, and they're, they're challenging to cover and challenging to understand as a voter looking at the whole state because there are a lot of them. We have 100 House seats and half of the 50 person Senate was up for election or is up for election this year too. Um, so just a lot of people moving around, a lot, a lot of candidates. I think there's like 300 total uh, legislative candidates or at least were until we, we called them last night. Um, right. What I was keeping an eye on was, was mostly the Republican side of the aisle, because the, and even if you talk to even Democratic leaders um, tend to expect the Republicans will like maintain control of the, the state legislature going into next year's cycle, you know, wh whether, whether Gianforte or Bussey are elected governor. Um, and you know, there, there are debates about like how big the Republican majority will be, and, and that'll be something that will be up to the voters to decide this coming fall. Um, but the and decision course, that was... Yeah. But, and, and of course, in 23, we had a historic supermajority, the GOP supermajority in the in the legislative yeah. session. So that's right. the that's going to be the right. measuring. Point. Right. Yeah. So about two thirds of lawmakers last time were Republicans, which is about as big as it's ever been. in at least the, the history I've looked at, which I think goes back to statehood. Um, the, we have new, new legislative maps this time. Um, we went through our redistricting cycle kind of post-2020 census. The, the new maps don't kick in until the 2024 election cycle for reasons that are long and interesting if you're a process nerd. Um, <laughs> but, but, but otherwise, just that is that leg. Um, 
So that means that most candidates, even the folks that are current lawmakers, are, are running on at least partially unfamiliar terrain if a legislator races this time. So that kind of created more opportunity for things to kind of get mixed up a little bit. Like people have to sell themselves to the voters. They haven't necessarily sold themselves to before. Um, the, the, the primary thing I was watching was the, the Republican side of the aisle and contested uh, Republican primaries um, is, I think, long time um, the folks that have been involved in Montana politics or people who watch Montana politics for a long time know, um, in part because the Republicans has a, a large supermajority, there's some uh, enough ideological space in the party that we see important political divisions between different wings of the party play out of the legislature. Um, and you can go down that rabbit hole and there are, there are a lot of different types of ideological divides that play out, but the, probably the most the easiest one to, to grasp and explain is there's kind of a, the, the, what I tend to call about, about or what, I think what other folks at Free Press too, tend to produce kind of the hardline wing of the party that tend to be more the more ideological. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of very serious about the, the ideologies they believe in and take that seriously and, and uh, get frustrated when other Republicans don't necessarily cue to those same lines. Um, and then you have the the other side of the party that um, sometimes it's called the, the Solutions Caucus or the, the Conservative Solutions Caucus because they started calling themselves because people were calling them moderates, which is probably fair in a comparative sense anyway. Um, but yeah, they, they, they tend to be kind of more the, the Chamber of Commerce style Republicans. Um, and as we noted briefly before, um, the, the governor who has taken flack for kind of hewing a little bit more close to that more relatively moderate wing of the Republican Party, he uh, issued endorsements in uh, um, several competitive Republican primaries. I think uh, I got my notes here. I think tw 24 um, contested Republican primaries. So I was watching to see how many of those folks won. The, the number of my count is 18 plus or minus one probably. Um, and then I was also watching uh, candidates that were backed by a, a, a uh, there was a political committee aligned with the Solutions Caucus of the Republican Party that was spending in legislative primaries for Republicans. Um, and I was watching to see which of the candidates, I'm just reporting on that in the capitalized newsletter we published last week. Uh, I was watching to see which had those candidates did last night. Um, and, you know, mixed bag there, I think 16 of 26 candidates backed by that pack went. So, you know, some victories for the hardliners, some victories for the, the comparative moderates in the Republican Party. Um, I don't, I don't know that there's a clear takeaway for like, that means we get a different legislature come next year or not. Yeah, I think we're going to see how that plays out. How unusual is it for the governor to make these kinds of endorsements at this stage? It, it, it may not be unusual at all. I just don't know, but I'm curious. Yeah, I haven't seen it before. Um, I think it, like it, it's a little bit new. This is the first time we've had a first time since the 90s. We've had a Republican governor who's seeking reelection Right, in a position in a position to endorse. Um, I don't I don't recall seeing anything similar under or Schweitzer or Bullock, and and honestly, that's about as far back as my political memory goes because I'm still a young pup in a lot of ways. So I mean, yeah, I, they, I they also wouldn't Aaron might know more from yeah. their own party for endorsing Republicans. Like the, the, they're just I mean, in in our, at least in our as as Eric said, relatively um, yeah novice uh, recollections. There has not been a political configuration like there is now. Um, so, I, you know, it, it's unique in the sense that Gianforte's position is a little unique, um, but I'm not 100 percent. I guess I don't know if it's unprecedented. Yeah. So and there's, and, a, there's a potential risk there of yeah, I mean, who may not win. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have and people it, that the governor didn't endorse uh, trying to work through, you know, working with the governor and the legislature. Yeah. I mean, the, the, if the voters pick somebody he doesn't like, he's stuck with them. And they, and they have that, you know, depending on who they are, they, they could have a chip on their shoulder about that. And. I think in, in some cases, I think that the, there was some language in, in the press release that he sent out announcing the endorsements that I think was kind of, kind of in, you know, these are people I can work with, the people. So that might be the people that got on his wrong side already. Um, I mean, that like endorsements are one of the levers you have to poll. You, you can poll as a governor and it might've been a way to kind of like try to get some people to fall in line or try to punish some people who didn't fall into line during the last session. Um, I mean, it's a little bit hard to know and, and without like looking deeply at the specifics of specific situations and trying to report that out. But um, I think that's for sure plausible. 
Yeah, I think I would also just add that even though I said earlier that uh, Gianforte like tends to be a pretty positive campaigner in terms of him just talking about his own self and ideals, he is also like a very calculating politician. He is he's a seasoned politician. He's um, he's been in this game for a long time, both at the federal level and now at the state level, and he doesn't take a lot of um, uncalculated risks. You know, like if he's going to um, back a policy Not or. <laughs> and and I, I think that this was an example of that. Like he he took a big swing by deciding to divide the party and into the people that he wanted to come back and the people that he didn't or the people he wanted to get in and the people that he wanted to go out. Um, and he must have made that calculation knowing that um, thinking that he was going to come out. Uh, decently on top there. But there are a couple of lawmakers who might still really be thorns in his sides. Um, he he had them last session. He might have them in the future session if he's, if he's victorious. Um, but I think that generally he is trying to create a coalition that actually gets things done, that you, you often hear him say that, like, I want to, you know, get things done. Because last session, the, the supermajority was so big, it was so unwieldy. There was like a gazillion micro factions that were kind of all angling for their own ends and it was difficult to herd that many cats to to get um you know big packages of bills through and i think that's what jane forte is trying to avoid next session which in fairness is the point of having a legislature is that like it it, it divides power and makes it harder for any single person to be a power broker right like it's intended like it's, i don't know that we wrote that into the constitution but it's pretty implicit that like the legislature exists to be a herd of cats I want to I want to take this calculation question one step further, and and I want to keep the answer really brief because we got just a couple more things to wrap up before we get to the end, which is approaching quickly here. So when we talk about a calculation that Gianforte is making that involves risk, um, what benefit is Gianforte looking for by steering the legislature in, if we understand correctly, the people that he endorsed in attempting to steer the legislature in a slightly more moderate direction? What's what are the what are the, which is another way of asking what are the stakes of the balance of power in the legislature in 2025 that we can see from here? What's what's what what questions are riding on this answer? You want us to get out of the realm of just political theory and into like what what issues we're actually going to get? I want you to I want, I want you to talk about Medicaid. <laughs> yes, uh, Mara's probably better positioned to talk about that than I am. Well, yeah, I, I mean, this is one example of an, a, an issue that certainly lobbyists and uh, groups in Helena are very concerned about. They're keeping an, an eye on Medicaid expansion, uh, which um, expanded the public health insurance program to single adults and to some other groups that weren't previously covered um, before 2015, is up for um, reauthorization. And uh, and that's kind of a, that's a big deal. I mean, potentially, if that doesn't pass, um, we could see a very changed healthcare landscape in Montana, and uh, a lot of people who currently are covered by that program no longer have co have coverage. It's also a big financial lifeline for a lot of um, uh, health institutions, hospitals, but other uh, medical providers as well. So that's something that a lot of folks have been talking about. Is like if we look at the Republican caucus, who do we think is going to be a vote for Medicaid expansion, and who do we think might be a vote against Medicaid expansion. And you saw the Montana Hospital Association putting money into the primaries, um, backing candidates that they thought would, um, you know, would would help them with that um, next next se session. And some Republican hardliners being very upset by that and saying, you know, the healthcare associations are meddling in, in these elections and da 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 da. But I think that's just one example. Um, I think the governor would probably say that Medicaid expansion is not at the top of his priority list, but um, property taxes certainly are. Property tax reform, um, talking about um, other other big ticket items. I think that um, depending on how much you do or don't believe the governor's messaging about himself, um, Gianforte can often be described as kind of a nerd and a policy wonk and somebody who wants to actually figure out a way to make government work in a certain way that makes sense to him. And he can't do that if he doesn't have people who are willing to roll up their sleeves, so to speak, and actually get down into the weeds and get to work. Um, so I think whatever the issue is, the governor just wants to have some success on big ticket policy issues. I'm going to, I'm going to well, very quickly add something. something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Aaron, let, we're, let Aaron go real quick. We're running out of time, but real quick and we'll, we'll get, because I, I, as some of you may know, I am I am a lame duck here. But um, I think 
I mean, I think the governor's office would probably like to see Medicaid um, expansion renewed because it's, a, frankly, a massive liability to the state if it doesn't happen. It's a huge amount of federal money. Um, second, I also think that like Gene Forte's objections to some of these people is not so much that they don't share the same policy objectives, but that, you know, frankly, a lot of the laws that, you know, are represent conservative priorities that um, would otherwise be in effect have been flagged by, you know, the legislature's and attorneys, Republican attorneys in many cases, as constitutionally questionable. Like, I think part of what Gene Forte hopes to buy is like more willing partners, sure. But, um, you know, I think maybe people who uh, are a little bit more committed to actually getting this stuff passed, because, like, I do think he's, I mean, he's openly, you know, pro-life. He's signed a lot of the bills that we associate with, like, the hard line of the Republican Party. And many of those are now, you know, caught up in court. But, like, but I think that he's a conservative and, like, people vote for him because they want to see conservative stuff passed. And, like, I think the chances of more conservative stuff passing are higher when, um, as Eric pointed out, the Republican caucus is a little bit more wieldy. Uh, and also that, you know, maybe the quality of legislator is a little higher. So if I heard you correctly, you, you think that what he's trying to buy is a more effective, yeah. more effective partners. Alex, uh, did you want to jump in on this? Yeah, I just, I had one other quick point. I think it's, there's also an element here in looking over the, the list of, um, building on on some past success and coalition building. I mean, a lot of the names that popped up were really instrumental um, Republicans from the Conservative Solutions Caucus in passing a raft of education reforms last session. It was one of the busiest sessions in recent memory on education. And these were a lot of initiatives that tie into Gianforte's message on workforce development, on career and tech technical education. And I think there there's an element too of trying to maintain that coalition and like revisit a lot of those issues deeper and fix some of that. And also with this massive, you know, review of education funding, make sure you've got some some Republican allies to to spearhead that conversation. So did anyone else want to pitch in on this question? All right, lightning round, two sentence answers. Thoughts on low turnout. Who's got the turnout numbers and how do they stack up? Alex? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was low turnout, um, not as low as 2022. Uh, we had 41% uh, turnout statewide. In 2022, it was 39%. In 2020, it was 53%. 2016, 45%. So it fluctuates. But it, it seemed low, but not maybe alarmingly low. Um, but I'm what did you say it was in 2020? It was it was 53 or 55 percent in 2020. So, I mean, this is in theory a, a similar electoral environment with the president on the ballot. Well, but a lot of but but a lot of incumbents at the statewide level. So 2020 I'm, was an all male ballot too, right? Because we were in the middle of COVID. Yes, right. thank you. Yeah, so everybody which is a great, thank you for reminding yeah. me, Eric. That's that's a good anomaly to 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 note. Uh, one more question, and then we're going to wrap this up. We're going to push this just a couple of minutes long because that's how we roll around here. Uh, question uh, out of Great Falls. <clears throat> how influential were Democratic voters in the Republican primary outcomes? Is there a way to estimate how many Democrats chose to return Republican ballots instead of Democratic Party ballots? I think this is a fascinating, que fascinating question because uh, I, voted a t I voted an atypical ballot. I'm not going to tell you what my typical ballot would be or what the atypical one was, but I voted atypically. So I, I, I did that cross ballot vote. It is my understanding, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, we don't have any way to quantify um, how many cross ballot votes uh, or, you know, or what kind of influence that kind of strategic voting may have had on the outcomes. I think you Correct. can look at the number of registered voters in each party and then the number of uh, ballots cast for each party, you know, county by county, or precinct by precinct, depending on how, how detailed you want to go into that. I think it's tricky because if you're registered independent, um, you, you get, uh, a, I think most everybody else too, like you get, you, you, you can basically get to pick your party, your, uh, party primary election by election anyway. So it's a little bit tricky to do that comparison, I think. Um, I don't. Yeah, I mean, in terms of cross voting, I mean, I, I, I hear a lot of pe people that are not necessarily political people, but are acquaintances in Helena who like said they were doing that this year. 
people who normally vote Democratic and um, and perhaps will vote Democratic in the the in the general, but we're voting the Republican primary ticket. But Helena's also a weird, you know, with apologies to those of us who live in Helena, Helena is a weird little like geeky community <laughs> that's like and usually engaged in politics. And I have no idea if that sort of thinking would be was similarly widespread even outside my social circle in Helena or like say in Bozeman or Billings. Yeah. I would also like to add that I think that so many people are fascinated in this question right now um, because we've had um, so many people move to the state since the start of the pandemic. And a lot of people are wondering, you know, if they which 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 party they trend toward and in which parts of the state that's true. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think um, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, and there, in fact, there was a New York Times story that came out, I think this week, maybe last week trying to parse some of those questions as well. All right, there's probably more we could talk about uh, and uh, we will continue doing our jobs and showing up for work for, um, you know, now and every evening for the rest of time. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we will be doing this again uh, prior to the general election and, uh, and after the general election. Um, just a little bit of house cleaning before we go. Um, I want to thank um, I want to thank especially Claire Overholt, our membership and development events. Uh, sorry, our membership and events manager, and Sarah Penix, our development manager. They're working behind the scenes. Uh, they are sharing some of our links with you there in the chat. They are feeding questions to us in a document that I'm looking at over on the side. They set all this up and are making sure everything runs smoothly. They don't get enough credit for these kind of events. Uh, really appreciate them uh, setting us up to. Not saying that we succeed, but they're setting us up to succeed, uh, and we appreciate that. Uh, obviously, I want to thank all of our reporters who uh, just bust their butts, um, and uh, I think I'm the only one yawning, but we were all here late last night um, tracking the elections. Uh, that's kind of fun. We get to order pizza. You know, it's a little bit of uh, journalism lore uh, on the late election nights. Uh, certainly fun to work with these folks. Uh, and I don't let want to let it go without saying... Uh, that uh, R.N. Kimball Senate is moving on to greener pastures after two years at Montana Free Press. Today, I think this is actually his last event. So uh, if I seem a little teary behind the scenes, that's also because we're gonna miss R.N. and R.N.'s good work uh, and uh, look forward to seeing what he's doing next out of Missoula. Uh, thank you for everything uh, you've done to help build Montana Free Press and uh, good luck in the next stuff. Um, that's all we've got. Uh, except to thank uh, those of you, I don't have an exact count, but I think this may be one of our biggest events ever. Um, this is also showing on Facebook. Uh, it is. It has been recorded and it will be shared later. Um, we really prioritize here at Montana Free Press engaging with our readers in all the ways that we can figure out how to do that. Uh, one of those is writing stories and putting our names on them and emailing them to you. Uh, and one of them is doing events like this. Um, we really appreciate your, uh, your involvement. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are a reader supported, donor supported business model. Um, you don't see advertising on our site. Um, and, uh, that's because Montanans like you, um, are supporting the work that we do. Uh, and it costs a decent amount of money to pay professional reporters, uh, professional salaries, so that they can be here and do things like this for us. Um, it's it's a real treat to be able to work with pros uh, that uh, are supported by an audience that cares enough to make it happen. Uh, that is you. Thank you very kindly. Um, there are always, you, you probably will not see a story of ours that doesn't have an orange donate button on it somewhere, so I, I don't need to give you any more direction about how to do that. Uh, if you are inclined, uh, your support is is noted and appreciated. Uh, and if you're not in a position to financially support this work, uh, we appreciate you sharing our newsletters, our stories with your friends, your family, talking about us, um, reading us, and just partaking in events like this. So thanks very much for being here. We appreciate your time. We've kept you four minutes over. I won't keep you any longer. Uh, and we'll say goodbye, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.